This time we focus on five superstars who found fame and fortune playing mutant superheroes. Ben Affleck may be pulling in the big bucks now, but he can still remember his first rather humble paycheck. It was about $150. I was washing dishes. I was about 15 years old. I got a job washing dishes at a at like a cheesy little restaurant that was trying to be upscale. It was called Poisson du Jour, but it was really it was really basically like coffee and crawlers. And uh, and then I worked at a movie theater, and then I worked construction, and still those paychecks never exceeded about $212 a week. Although I do remember always asking to be, when I went to the bank to cash my check, check I would say, you know, you, you can give me that in hundreds. Since winning a Best Original Screenplay Oscar with his childhood friend Matt Damon for Goodwill Hunting, he's never had to worry where the next meal was coming from, although he has had his fair share of ups and downs. After breaking through with Goodwill Hunting, he scored a string of leading man roles in successful crowd pleasers, such as Armageddon, Changing Lanes, The Sum of All Fears and Pearl Harbor. He then hopped on the silly suit bandwagon to play a blind attorney by day and a masked avenger by night in Daredevil. This was my favorite comic book when I was a kid. That's why I wanted to do this movie. I love this character. I think he's uh, interesting and more, a little more complex than some of your more black and white kind of uh, Boy Scout superheroes from the 50s. And uh, I really liked it. That one man can make a difference. The movie fared Justice. fairly well at the box office, but it was his co-star Jennifer Garner who stole the show, making off with her own spin-off, Electra. Right nice to meet you. I didn't get your name. I didn't give it. Ben's date at the Daredevil premiere was fiancé Jennifer Lopez, who he met while filming the romantic comedy Gingli at the height of J.Lo's popularity. Their romance sparked a media frenzy, and Benefer became the hottest topic of gossip. At the Gili premiere, all anyone wanted to know was when they were getting married. Um, well, we, we decided we were going to use this evening as a forum to announce that date, and at the last minute we changed our minds. And we're all invited, right? Yes, this is, we'll have to have a much bigger press line. I, I, I have one wedding. question for you. Going by the rather forced smiles on the night, the decision not to announce a wedding date had not been arrived at amicably. Or perhaps Ben and Jen were just bracing themselves for the inevitable scathing reviews. Hello. I'm, I'm sorry. Gili went down like done. a lead balloon. It tanked at the box office, losing $50 million, <coughs> winning its stars a Razzie apiece, plus another for worse screen couple. Just leave a faint scent. Thank you. To make matters worse for Ben, his two other performances of the same year in Daredevil and Paycheck also received a dishonorable mention at the Golden Raspberry Awards. After blaming the media for his split with Jennifer in 2004, he got yet another Razzie nomination for his betrayal of a Have It All music publicist whose life goes pear-shaped in the Kevin Smith film Jersey Girl. At least he was finally out of the glare of the paparazzi spotlight. No, it's nice. It's nice to have things quiet down a little bit and have focus be on a, a movie rather than about my uh, personal life or anyone else's personal life. And uh, I think that's the way it should be in general because who cares about the other stuff? You know what I mean? Actors are interesting if they're interesting at all for the movies they make. Things started to look up on the romance front after he hooked up with his Daredevil co-star. Jennifer Garner may share a first name with his former fiance, but she definitely doesn't share JLo's thirst for publicity, preferring to keep her private life, well, private. In December 2005, she gave birth to their first child, and in 2006, Ben's professional fortunes also started looking up. After his two-year break from the big screen, your husband. He was cast as original Superman George Reeves, whose suspicious death exposes the sinister underbelly of 1950s Hollywood. The warm reception of his performance by critics was a very welcome change. I, I certainly feel uh, it's nice to have a movie that people kind of like in general, you know. Um, try not to be too focused on um, any kind of outside approbation, but certainly it is nice. I mean, you know, it's better than having a movie that people don't like. Let's not fight. No, let's. Jessica Alba's on-screen image as a butt-kicking mutant superhero bears no witness to her Don't sickly start in real life. 
Born in Pomona, California, she suffered a multitude of maladies and mishaps, including two collapsed lungs and frequent bouts of pneumonia. After appearing in two seasons of the TV series Flipper and several films, she got her big breakthrough as the genetically engineered Max in James Cameron's series Dark Angel, pipping 1,200 other hopefuls to the post. She briefly became engaged to her Dark Angel co-star Michael Weatherly. Her next big role entailed taking dancing and Tai Bo lessons to play an exotic dancer in Frank Miller's Sin City. Here I was expecting a skinny little bookworm. Maybe a bit too shy for her own good. Anybody with a hot bones love. Despite frequently appearing scantily clad in magazine spreads, she found the overt sexuality of her character challenging. No, I was totally freaked out playing a stripper. I am very uh, reserved. And being on stage, I get freaked out. You know, it's bizarre that I chose to be an actress for a living. Um, so I, I went around to strip clubs and asked the girls how they got the bravery to get on stage. And I tried to steal some moves from them. But for the most part, I just tried to understand the bravery of getting on stage and stripping for strangers. Still, she threw herself into the role. However, she's now keen to avoid being typecast in sex kitten roles. When a shot of her in a bikini appeared without her permission on the cover of Playboy magazine, she threatened to sue, until Hugh Hefner apologized and donated money to charity. The photo came from a promotional shoot for her 2005 movie, Into the Blue. The tense action adventure was set in the shark-infested waters of the Bahamas, and the dive training Jessica received from her lifeguard mother helped her face her fears. I knew we were going to use real sharks, and I knew we were going to be out in the middle of the ocean in the Bahamas, and I was scared. I can't lie. Um, but, you know, I, I overcame my fear, and we pulled it off, so. Back on dry land, she's much more comfortable showing off clothes than skin and is a regular at Oak Couture runway shows. I think Galliano is um, really imaginative and um, has such a great spirit. And uh, I love what he's done at Dior, so. Her beauty and sense of style combined to make her US Weekly magazine style icon of the year in 2006. Um, it's uh, very flattering and um, wonderful and I'm um, I never really thought of myself as being stylish in that kind of way like on a bigger scale I mean I like the way I look when I go out on the, you know different things but the fact that other people acknowledge it is uh, you know it's nice it's flattering I don't know what to say it's nice to be wanted sometimes. after that it was back to playing mutant superheroes as Sue Storm in Fantastic Four heard Look at me. Her alter ego's capacity to make herself invisible is no doubt a skill okay. she wouldn't mind mean, nailing in real life. Look at me. Sue, look at your hands. But after two outings as the only girl in the group, she's pretty cozy with her diversely gifted comic book comrades. And we still are a family unit, so we only really work perfectly as superheroes together. And I think that's another really great element, and certainly for, for kids. Australia's Eric Banner may have come to international attention as a dramatic actor, but he's best known at home as an award-winning comedian, getting his start on sketch comedy TV series Full Frontal before launching The Eric Banner Show in the mid-90s. Despite his lack of dramatic experience, his comic performances and talent as a mimic led infamous Australian criminal Chopper Reed to suggest Eric for the lead in his biopic. Playing Chopper involved gaining 30 pounds and shaving his head. Now tell me this, right? Why would I shoot a bloke, bang, and then put him in the bloody car and whiz him off to the hospital at 100 miles an hour? Even more impressive was Eric's acclaimed performance, which led to Ridley Scott casting him as an American soldier in Black Hawk Down. That makes a difference. People ask me, why do you do it, man? They want to understand it's about the men next to you. His first Hollywood starring role was as genetics researcher Bruce Banner, whose experiments on himself have rather alarming side effects. The film made little impression on critics, but gave Eric plenty of opportunity to vent those pent-up feelings. Uh, I don't think I could get any angrier than I do in this movie, no. 
Now, I'm, I've peaked. My anger has peaked, I think. He could have done with a little of his green alter ego's superhuman strength when going up against Brad Pitt in his next blockbuster, Troy. Playing Paris's long-suffering brother, he's forced to take on the superior skill of Achilles in one of the movie's most dramatic scenes. He then landed the lead in the big screen account of the 1972 Munich Olympics massacre in 2006. Uh, I got a phone call uh, telling me that uh, Steven Spielberg wanted to meet with me and uh, obviously uh, took up that offer, uh, sat down, met with him, he told me about the film and about this character and that he wanted me to play the part. So I was shocked and scared and so forth and um, just basically started researching it straight away. Um, and then it was about 18 months later or thereabouts we started. started Growing up in Australia, uh, Middle East politics was not something that was prevalent in our curriculum. So I really felt as though I needed to understand a lot more about that, just for my own character, you know, playing an Israeli. I felt like I really had to understand the, the history of that, that region. So I had a couple of years to, um, to learn about it and feel uh, better for it, you know. It's one of the good parts about this job that you are forced to learn about things that you didn't know enough about initially. The virtual topic gave Eric some much needed weight as an actor and secured his invitation to top draw red carpet events. And it's all sort of new to me. I, I haven't done many award shows outside of my own country, so I'm sure it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, I'm looking forward to it. The example he sets for other actors... He's also found a home amongst the growing community the of expat Australian stars that have invaded man, Hollywood husband, over the past decade. Despite all the fuss and fame, he seems unlikely to get sucked too far into the Hollywood machine pumping out several films a year. Um, I tend not to do a, a lot of them. I, I tend not to work unless I, I'm really falling in love with a, with a script or a character. So I'm probably not one of those people that churns out a lot of movies. I just try and choose the ones that, you know, really, really excite me. Um, so, I mean, hopefully that, that, um, that, that kind of uh, idea um, enables me to to hold out and you know just wait for wait for ones that that I'm really interested in and, and that are hopefully better. So yeah, I'm probably not one of those actors who will have a hundred film credits at the end of his career. Um, I try and miss out miss the ones in between and just and just do the ones I'm really excited about. <laughs> Having traipsed the red carpet as a model, a beauty queen and an award-winning actress, Halle Berry is no stranger to the limelight. But in 2004, she admitted she was rather nervous ahead of the premiere screening of Catwoman. A, a, little, a little alone, <laughs> a little frightened, um, but, you know, excited that, you know, as a woman, I'm getting an opportunity to sort of try this whole thing and I hope that it goes well so that other women will have a chance you know to be, take part in sort of the summer extravaganza that are these movies amateurs jumps around like a cat and it wasn't that she didn't put in the hard yards Ready and action. Changed my diet I learned um, capoeira a Brazilian form of martial arts which incorporates dance and gymnastics and um, watched hours of tapes on cats, big cats, small cats, learned how to try to move my, my body like a cat as much as I could because our bodies are different, but I tried to take, you know, some of the movements and incorporate them into a human body. All her hard work was rewarded with a box office flop and enough critical Ladies derision to earn her her Kelly first Barry. Razzie Award. She stepped up to accept the honour with laudable grace and humour. She'd come a long way from Cleveland, Ohio, where she was born to an English mother and an African-American father and named after a department store. At high school, she was a cheerleader and editor of the school newspaper before graduating as prom queen and going on to play six in the Miss World competition of 1986. Tragedy struck three years later, when during the taping of a television series, she fell into a coma and was diagnosed with type one diabetes. After a breakthrough role in Spike Lee's Jungle Fever, she played a former drug addict struggling to regain custody of her son in Losing Isaiah. 
After winning an Emmy and Golden Globe for her portrayal of Dorothy Dandridge in the HBO biopic, she played the mutant Storm in the first installment of the X-Men franchise, which ended in 2006 with X-Men The Last Stand. Being a vocal campaigner for social tolerance and racial acceptance, she felt an affinity with the struggles of her outcast alter ego. Um. Yeah, and this time around, she's also emerges as a warrior. You get to see another side of Storm that's more reflective of the Storm in the comic book. She was a leader of a African country. She was like a goddess in her country, and in this movie, she really stands up as a strong woman with a strong opinion, and and that's very much who I am. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty opinionated. <laughs> But the crowning moment of her career so far, no doubt, came in 2001, when a heart-rending performance as the widow of an executed murderer struggling to raise her morbidly obese son made her a shoo-in to win an Academy Award. Her next eye-catching role was as Bond girl Jinx in the 2002 blockbuster Die Another Day. Her on-screen arrival mirrored that of Ursula Andress emerging from the surf in 1962's Dr. No. Your mama. She then ventured into the world of psychological thrillers, alongside Robert Downey Jr. and Penelope Cruz in Gothica. She may not have received good reviews, but she was laughing all the way to the bank with a pay packet of $14 million. She pocketed the same amount again for Catwoman. This is the girl that I saw. This is the girl. It's impossible. She died four years ago. That girl came to me, and she has a very specific agenda. Miranda, what's that? Something is really happening to me. With two poorly received movies in a row and the announcement of her divorce from famously unfaithful singer-songwriter Eric Benet, Hallie was at a bit of a low point. Thankfully, the job offers kept rolling in. As well as starring in another thriller, Perfect Stranger, alongside Bruce Willis and Giovanni Ribisi, she also teamed up with Benicio Del Toro in Things We Lost in the Fire and is set to reunite with Monsters Ball co-star Billy Bob Thornton in Class Act. Hallie takes it all in her stride. I mean, there's glamorous moments. You know, when we're at Cannes and, and the world's press is there, that'll be a glamorous moment. But that moment is fleeting, you know? And most of the 365 days of the year, you know, I'm just a, a woman trying to make her way, trying to understand this thing called life. And I suffer from sexism, racism in my own way, in my everyday life. And, and I'm battling it as well. And I'm battling to get people to accept women and accept people of color as we are. For a passionate campaigner like Sir Ian McKellen, the so-called furor over Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code was rather underwhelming. I think the, the controversy is so low-key, it's unbelievable. I mean, the, 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 the book has been out and read by 63 million people over the last five years. There hasn't been a peep out of any of the authorities who are now rather quietly murmuring. I think nothing more than that. It's what one means, Monsignor, in the Vatican doesn't really make up the whole of the Catholic Church, you know. So I, I, I'm surprised there hasn't been more fuss, frankly. We are in the middle of a Still, war. clearly one enough fuss had been forever. made over the novel's blasphemous Protect suggestions so to ensure that Ron Howard's big screen adaptation pulled in over $750 million worldwide, extending Sir Ian's of run of box office blitzers. Saluted, then. Robert! What can an old cripple do for you? I'm into something here that I cannot understand. You asked what will be worth killing for. It all began in the year 2000 with X-Men. Still smarting from the murder of his parents, his character Magneto builds a machine with which he intends to transform all humans into mutants. They say you're the bad guy. <gasps> Is that what they say? The next year, he leapt on another bankrolling bandwagon, playing the wizard Gandalf in Peter Jackson's epic Lord of the Rings trilogy. Protecting hobbits and guarding the integrity of the Tolkien classic was a responsibility he took very seriously, and he was touched by the response of the die-hard fans. 
they, these these uh, people, not all of them kids, are not screaming for movie stars. They're screaming for the actors who are in Lord of the Rings. They're fans of the movie, I can tell. It was the same in Wellington. They're shouting out your, the characters' names, as well as your own name. Before hitting his blockbuster straps in Hollywood, Sir Ian enjoyed a long stage and television career in Britain, making his stage debut in Coventry way back in 1961. In 1991, he received a knighthood for his outstanding contribution to the theatre. Although his homosexuality was an open secret among his theatre colleagues, he didn't officially come out to the general public until 1988. Since then, he's made up for lost time, lobbying the British government for gay rights and doing his bit to improve gay visibility in Hollywood. <laughs> anyway, I, I don't attend to critics, I listen to audiences. Okay. It is very, very, very difficult, still thought to be very difficult, for an American actor who wants a film career uh, to be open about uh, his uh, sexuality, and even more difficult for, for a woman if, if, if she's lesbian. It, it, it's very distressing to me that that should be the case. It's not true of, of, of actors on the other side of the American continent, on Broadway, where people are very at ease with being open and honest. But the film industry <laughs> is very old-fashioned uh, uh, in California. I am bound up you. His first international breakthrough role was as a South African tycoon in Six Degrees of Seven. <laughs> In 2005, his body of work was recognized by the Berlin International Film Festival, which presented him with an honorary golden bear. To, to be uh, honored by people who know what they're doing, you know, um, a, a great festival like this to, to say welcome and come back, and, and here is a, a, a memento of, of um, your visit and your career is, is, is a wonderful thing, and I'm very grateful for it. But at the same time, I know that maybe they're doing it because they think I'm getting to be so decrepit that I may not be able to make the journey across from London in future. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you know, Lifetime Achievement Awards, uh, I still hope I've got a lot of life left uh, <laughs> on stage and, and making films. So, but on the whole, I'm absolutely delighted. He may have been a late bloomer as far as international superstardom goes, but Sir Ian is certainly enjoying living it up. One of the perks of the Da Vinci Code marketing tour was a record-breaking VIP trip on Eurostar. So, nice European connection. So, Eurostar, it all makes sense, doesn't it? And then down to Cannes. And I think we're going to break the land speed record. That's the, that's the idea. And with a Cecil Rhodes biopic and his own X-Men spin-off in the offing, he looks set to stay aboard the blockbuster gravy train.